Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, um, by the way, if you've been following my <laughs> if you've been following my webcomic at all, I finally have my actual laptop back. Uh, had a broken screen for weeks. I actually had to cancel or reschedule some interviews. So the podcast has been kind of sporadic the past couple of weeks, but I have it back now. Not important. I just wanted to mention it because it's nice to have it back and everything's set up the way I like it. Now, on today's show, I talked to a painter, an abstract painter who is based in New York, and they tell me about how they moved from the West Coast to the East Coast and uh, just getting started with painting, then kind of going into sculpture, but then finding their way back to painting. And we talk about finding uh, galleries and people to connect with as far as the community and getting their work out there and selling work and just really uh, how they also discovered the unique style of the paintings slash sculptures that they kind of do. And I say that because their paintings are... Uh, they're, they're kind of sculptures in themselves as well as paintings. So we talk about the whole process. Um, they actually explain the process flat out uh, on the way that they work with one of their unique pieces. So here is the interview starting right now. My name is Debbie Keynote and I'm a painter. Um, I did my master's in sculpture, so I also bring like a sculpturally aspect to my paintings. Um, and I live in Brooklyn in New York City. Okay. And how long have you lived there? Um, I have looked at the question. I've been here for, I think this summer, it's nine years. Nine years. Okay. Where did you live originally? Like, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Washington State. Um, very close to the Canadian border. Wow. If you've been, I don't know if you've been over in that area. But it's I have, but that's a that's yeah. a big move. That's you, yeah. one side yeah. of the country to the other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people ask me, like, why did, why did you leave? Um, but, but yeah, I, I really like it here. I feel like this is home for me now. But I am fortunate that I get to go back usually like two times a year, once or twice. Um, um, but yeah, I grew up very close to the Canadian border and on an island, but it's an island with a bridge. So Wait a it's like, kind of like the island culture, but you have uh, access to the mainland. Wait, you um, grew up on an island? I did. Okay, that yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know there were islands around that area. So, yeah, yeah, the San Juan Islands. There, they, it's funny because like Vancouver Island wraps around like in Canada, and then you have like all these little islands in the U.S. and then the like northern Canadian border up here. Um, and yeah, so you have like this weird pocket of, of really beautiful islands. There, I mean, it's pretty cold there. Um, yeah. Like not like actually that cold, but it's very wet. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not like tropical islands, but you have right. Like, yeah. But but I am okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on this just for a second because it has yeah. always fascinated me. I've heard things like because uh, I hate winter, and uh -huh. and I live in the Midwest, dumbest place to live in the entire world for winter. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're in New York, and that's it gets pretty darn cold there too. You guys get it pretty bad, even though you're by. Yeah, it's a lot colder here than. The yeah. And in the Northwest, I've heard that actually sometimes it's just like, it's just the rainy season. Like winter isn't yeah. really winter. Is that true? Uh, oh yeah. It's, uh, it's, there's not it's kind of, kind of. So there's okay. like, um, there's like two seasons in the Northwest. There's like summer and not summer, um, <laughs> and like not summer. It rains a lot and it rain And like, yeah, it gets like definitely colder. And then like, before, you know, like maybe a decade ago when climate change really started to like the effects of it started to hit us. Mm -hmm. Like I like growing up, I experienced like some pretty um, significant winters, but it was always like maybe two weeks to a month a year where you get like maybe a couple of feet of snow. And that was like a big deal. And you'd play in the snow and such. Um, and there's not a big like infrastructure for snow there. So usually people kind of like camp out and they don't like there's not as many like snow plows and things like there are in New York because it was like. Right. Oh, we'll just cancel school for like a week. Um, but now that it's getting warmer, um, they occasionally have like, you know, good snow. Um, but overall, I think the snow isn't as as strong. Um, so, or at least okay. like the ice freezing of the lakes and stuff. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's kind of sad, but um, climate change has made weather more extreme in other ways. So I think there has been like one or two really heavy snow years because yeah. of it. Okay. Um, but overall, it's kind of like rainy season not rainy season uh, and everyone goes to visit in the not rainy season and it's like 
70 and beautiful in an island. And really? Like, oh my God, I'm going to move here. And then they come in the other time and they're like, oh my God, this is so great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And, and that's why I ask is because I learned that for, you said you were by Canada and I spoke with somebody yeah. from Vancouver and they were just like, yeah, it's not really winter here. It just gets kind of cold. Yes. And I'm like, well, I'm fine with that. Like autumn weather, like I'm okay. I don't like autumn. I prefer uh-huh. summer. But anyway, I don't need to go off on this. Isn't a, a weather report podcast. It's clearly I'm fascinated with somewhere not here. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> now let's talk about. So you moved to New York. Now, uh, what what prompted the move there? Why, why did you move to um, where you live? I moved here because I was starting um, grad school. Okay. Um, so I was yeah, you know, I was studying art in undergrad, um, and I. We did this, I did a BFA program, which is a postback program. Mm-hmm. And it was um, it was really great, but it was an additional year program basically. So I had like studios and like um, a lot more just like intensive art classes and less like general requirements. And one of the classes I took, which I'm really grateful for, was a professional practices class. And the professor was like, one of the assignments was we had to apply for grad school, like up into the point where you'd have to actually like press submit and pay the fee. Um, and so I had to like request my transcripts and get like letters of recommendation and do all the like, you know, portfolio building and everything in the essay. Um, and then we critiqued each other's essays and most people didn't actually like press send and like pay because they didn't really know if they wanted to go to grad school. But for me, I was, I was also like homeschooled growing up. And so I really started like my public education in high school. I didn't have like so many years of, of being like stuck in like school schedules. So I was kind of hungry for more. Um, so I got accepted into Brooklyn college and I moved here like right after I graduated, um, and started in the sculpture program because I had been moving like from painting to kind of installation. And I was like, well, maybe I'll keep moving that way. I didn't ultimately like end up like graduating and being a sculptor. I kind of slowly worked back to painting, but, um, but I was, I'm glad I did it because I learned a lot about um, just like different tools and like how to think about painting in a more physical way. Um, mm-hmm. And just like think about space when I'm uh, creating in general. Um, but yeah, so I moved here for my master's and my thought was like, I'll probably stay for a couple of years after and if I still love it, I'll stay. Um, but yeah, a couple of years went by and I was just getting deeper into the art scene. And it takes a while in New York to kind of like unlock the, um, the scene here because there's it's so big Mm -hmm. so you have to like put time in and network and go to openings and every year just gets better in in my experience here the first couple years were a bit of an adjustment because it's such a big city yeah and so you said you were actually leaning more towards uh would be like curating and and gallery ship i don't know the words for but you were saying Um, you were getting out of actually creating and more into the curating leaning leaning towards sculpture oh yeah Okay, I thought you said curating for some reason, but I did hear sculpture oh, I as well. Have, okay, I did some curating as well. Okay, um, so you're not you're not wrong about that. <laughs> okay, but, good. Um, yeah, yeah, I did I do some curating, um, more just like for fun. For a while, I was trying to do it more seriously, and I just started to realize it was like really competing with the time I had for my own work. Um, so now I do it kind of like maybe once every year or two. I'll do like a show that I curate. Um, yeah. And I find it's handy to do that. I don't, I think it's actually rare that I run into something, somebody that uh, paints that hasn't somehow helped throw yeah. together an yeah. event. Like it's one of those things. It's kind of like uh, as a musician, you also kind of have to be a promoter a little bit. You have to yeah. set up a show, find bands yeah. to play with like things like that. Like artists in general, you have to have other people to do things with for some reason. We all need each yeah. other. <laughs> I feel like curating to me feels a lot like my partner is a DJ and, Oh, he also nice. makes music. Yeah. And so I feel like I I see a lot of similarity there between like him being a musician and him also being a DJ. Yeah. And like me being an artist and also being a curator because curating, you're bringing together like often other people's art and then you're like finding similarities between them and like creating a new it's it's an art form, but it's made out of other people's art and like for other people's art. Um, 
yeah so i think it's similar okay and so with the sculpting now now getting to what you actually said as opposed to what i thought i heard <laughs> so why did you uh you lean towards sculpting but then uh you said that you got drawn back to painting like what was what yeah. was that transition there like what was what happened there um, well so in in undergrad i was thinking a lot about um like I, I grew up in a more like traditional art, like not, um, how do I say this? I grew up like the art I was learning as a kid was very traditional. So I learned how to draw and how to paint and like the, the little bits of art I was exposed to were like books of more like representational things. So I was doing that in high school. And then when I got to college, my undergrad program, Western Washington University, they are a pretty conceptual school. And so they, it's a really good program. Um, but they they really pushed me to to like have some answers for why I was painting the things I was painting, and I didn't really have answers. I was kind of just like technically painting, so I got more like more and more like experimental and started like thinking, oh maybe I don't need paint at all, and and making more metaphorical um, spaces like environments that I guess they really were installations at the time, like things you could go inside, like some tunnels. Oh. And, um, so um, yeah, they're very playful. Um, and then because of that, that was like the final work I was doing. I mean, there was a really great sculpture program at my undergrad, but I had never really gone in there. And so I was like, man, I really should have probably been learning because now I'm starting to build these environments and I don't really know how to use tools very well. That wasn't something I uh, learned growing up. And so I thought like, oh, well, sculpture, that would, that's the next like, I'm continuing this direction. That's the next thing is physically building things. Mm -hmm. And I did for like the first year, I was making a lot of installations still in grad school. And um, it was helpful because I learned from other sculptural students and from faculty, like how to, how to build things better and how to, um, I don't know, I think sculpture is often kind of minimal, not always, but like historically there's been a lot of minimal sculpture. Mm -hmm. And when you work more minimally in any genre, there's a lot more, um, you have to do it really well because like the quality has to be done really well. Like if you're welding, the welds need to be good. If you're joining wood, your like joints need to be really good. Um, so I started, um, just getting a lot more technical skills, but then I, the whole time I was kind of missing painting and Brooklyn college is like a really heavy painting program. I was the only sculptor student of my year. Yeah. Um, and so I was like surrounded by all these painters and they're having so much fun painting. And like the program was founded by Mark Rothko, so it's very like abstract heavy too. And um, yeah, so I, I started kind of thinking more like three dimensional painting and I was making these environments that were like sculptural, but very mm -hmm. painterly. Um, and then some like modular sculptures. Uh, and then I graduated and I just was like, done with a sculpture degree, like no more pressure for thesis. <laughs> and I so like slowly started just like remembering how to paint again, basically. Hmm. Um, yeah, but I but I feel like it was good because I I like it's almost like I saw it's like the red pill. Like I, I saw something I can't unsee now. Like I can't I can't look at painting without it also being an object. Yeah. Um, so also, I, I love that you just did a matrix reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It really feels like that. Like I I um I don't know. I really love like substrates of painting stretchers and also I like I've on and off again art handled um throughout my art career so I've seen like a lot of different ways of making paintings like in galleries yeah. um so I'm, I'm very fascinated with the structures of paintings okay and then when so when you you decided to go back to painting which um I guess, how would you explain your work at that point when you went back to painting? Like, how do you describe your work? And uh, mm -hmm. has it, I mean, is it the same then when you went back to it as it is what you're do as it is to what you're doing now? Um, let's see. When I first started going back to it, I was in, I actually went to Mexico for um, a month. And then I went straight from there to the Vermont Studio Center. So I Hmm. I did like when I was in Mexico, I was working on a tempera with, um, with a tempera on paper. Cause it, I was just kind of like, I think honestly, I was afraid of canvas because I worked so far away from canvas that I, I didn't want to go back. Um, hmm. and so I was like, Oh, I'll work on paper. Like that's, that's different than 
than like the traditional painting I like had learned before. And I've um, rarely spoken with someone who said that they worked in tempera. So that's yeah, yeah. yeah it was it was cool. I mean, it's it was kind of a bad idea for Mexico though because I had like I was working for an artist there, and I had a little corner of her studio. I was painting in like after hours, and I would attract all these ants because <laughs> <laughs> they would smell the egg yolk. Um, huh. And so yeah, but it was really great for traveling because I just brought pigments with me that I would mix into egg yolk, um, and so I had like a very light like traveling setup um, and paper. You know, paper is really easy. Okay. To pack, but, Yes, yeah, so I did that for a little while. And then I went to the Vermont Studio Center and I was getting frustrated with like, with the boundaries of the paper. I was like, oh, I wish, wish I could just like cut it, you know, or like make it a shape. Like, why does it have to be so rigid? Which is probably like the sculptor in me that had been released. Mm -hmm. was just like, oh, it's so rigid. Um, and so I started physically cutting the paper like into shapes. And after um, you've painted it? After I painted it, yeah. Okay. Um, so kind of like carving out of my paintings and then when I got and they were very small like they were kind of studies they weren't really meant to be shown and then when I got to Vermont Studio Center like all I had was those things basically and um so I started I, I basically like took them to the wood shop and was asking like the technicians there like hey like what do you think the best way would be for me to like blow these up on wood and they were like well we have a scroll saw which is like really tight curves and I was like oh yeah I've used that before okay um, and my grad program so I like somebody else there helped me get a bunch of wood and I started like jigsawing and um scroll sawing out these panels mm -hmm. um, and that was like the beginning of the shapes for me um and then since then I realized like I don't really enjoy panels so I I had kind of an in-between chapter where I was like working on canvas again but kind of like not really loving it. Um, and then I figured out that I could do modular canvases, maybe in like 2020, mm -hmm. um, where I could start combining them. And then from there, I was like, well, what if I just made them shapes or like modular shaped ones that go together? So I just kind of kept getting more and more um, custom to like the way that I would have liked to make them from the beginning, but I didn't really know how. So I was working through ideas. Um, yeah, okay. and that's a yeah, you can see some behind me. Yeah, no, and so now you are painting on canvas now? Yeah, well, for a while I was actually doing linen, and then when I started dyeing the canvases, which is like new, the dyeing started last year. Um, that's like a whole other thing that happened to my work where um, I was using linen, but linen is really difficult to stretch. Oftentimes you have to stretch it um, twice, and so like with the, with the whole process, it's kind of complicated to explain, but basically like I was buying pre-treated linen so that I didn't have to stretch it twice, but pre-treated you can't dye. Okay. So I started like slowly going back to canvas and maybe it was the way, because it's a shaped thing and, and I'm dying it, it doesn't feel like canvas to me, it feels custom. Okay. Um, I don't know, I get kind of hung up on like, just like boring old canvas um, for some reason. It's it's my own like blind spot. Right. <laughs> um, well and uh, yeah. on top of doing that, creating these shaped sort of, well, I mean, canvases, I guess I don't know what else to call it, shaped yeah. Uh, yeah, platforms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. And it's important to me that they're actual canvases versus yeah. those like um, panels. But even structuring them, like that's, yeah. that's more work. Like yeah. you, <laughs> it's not, yeah. when, when you're yeah. saying you didn't want it to be as rigid, now you're like, I mean, behind you, okay. you have the thing with the oh, yeah, pointy like edges and the curves and everything. Yeah. And now in the back, there's stuff you have to do to make that work. And you're, you're talking about how you can't pull it, but it's like, yeah, now you got to pull it in all kinds of weird, different directions. So yeah. how, what was the trial and error with making that work? How, how difficult yeah. was that to do for projects? Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's funny because like, there's this saying, I don't know who it's by, but like I've, I've been told before, but like, um, you don't need to worry about someone copying your own work if it's your own work mm -hmm. because like no one can copy the way your brain works. And like, it's for me, that's kind of how, how it is. Like it's, yes, it's more difficult to make. Yes. They're a huge pain. Like if I had the money, I would totally have an assistant helping me, but they, <laughs> but they also are like kind of easier to make because they're like how my brain thinks. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like for, for other people, I'm sure they like are not really interested in making work like this because it's physically more labor. But for me, it's just, it's intuitive. Um, but for the troubleshooting part of it, I think 
I mean, I mess up a lot still, which is kind of part of it. Like actually these two pieces, um, they're, I have them at home cause they're small because they're like the smallest ones I've made of these shapes because I messed they're them up. They're not small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not that small, but they, um, but they're like, they're like 20 something, but, okay. um, but I, I messed them up because I was trying to make a really complicated star and I can't, I tried like three times and I messed up every single time. I still couldn't figure out the math because I do it all by hand. I don't have a program or anything. And that occasionally will happen. And what happens is I have all these scraps and then I make things like these that are like a little bit smaller pieces. Um, so I still, I still like mess up a lot, but um, I think I've figured out like, a few things like I have to go really slow with the woodworking. Like I have to be super precise because in the beginning I was like, Oh, I'll just like, it's, it's like a 16th inch off. Like who cares? But mm -hmm. like that one 16th inch will like, if it's a modular modular piece in particular, it will like add up to be a quarter inch. And then the whole thing is off a little. Right. Um, and so I've, I guess it's just been like moving slow and like having patience. Um, yeah. That's that's been the most like, troubleshooting, I guess. Right. Yeah. You don't want to be the person who makes every table that I sit at at a restaurant. So it's always like, you know, tilting. Yes, I, know, I swear, right? every table, oh, yeah. like somebody just make them table. level. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A little rant from me there. Um, it just happened to me again yesterday. So and I, it's uncanny how it happens. Anyway. I know it does. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so now the way that you were painting before, you said you started out with paper and then cut yeah. it out. You would paint it first with yeah. these like sculptured paintings behind you yeah are you painting them first and then attaching it to it or are you setting up the shape and then um, painting on it i set up the shape first i can walk you through the whole process if okay you yeah please do how my, how my weird like self-made process is. yeah um, it sounds very official but it's just my weird brain um so i the way i do it is i start with a sketch for like the shapes and usually they're like this this whole series has been derived from quilting blocks so that's like the basic block that makes up a quilt okay so it's like a brick in the wall um so i'll do like research in the library and then i'll find like a quilting shape that i like hmm. um and then i'll build i'll figure out the math for it on paper and then i build all the stretcher bars like assemble it and then i decide what color i want the dye to be for the piece and then i like dye the canvas in my studio and after it's all like washed and everything then I um, assemble it. And so then you have like the whole form without any paint on top of it. And then I'll do like some clear gesso and um, I'll photograph that. And then I open it in my iPad and then I start sketching like over it in my iPad. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, most of the time, actually, I'll actually sketch on paper, just a random sketch. And then I'll like float that on top of mm. it apparently and kind of like play with different things. Cause I think one reason I really like shape paintings is it's a bit of a puzzle. Like you have to, you're you feel like the shape is so fixed that you have like, you're, you're floating something else on top of it and you have to like work with the shape. So it feels balanced and like kind of play with the way that the image will go off the edges in unexpected ways and um, not make it too like feel too forced or anything. Um, so yeah, once I like work through some iPad and physical sketching, then I actually start painting. Um, and for these ones, I've been using a projector to sketch out the shapes because oh. I used to not do that. But now that they're dyed, I like to leave a lot of the dye visible. And if I have like a ton of like pencil or eraser, then it, it shows on top of the dye. <laughs> okay. So I've had to like add little extra things in um, throughout the process. So instead of sketching on it, you just use the projector and then use that as the sketch. How long do you have to keep that set up then well, if you do that? Well, I still, I still sketch it, but I use the projector to like actually map it in. Okay. Before I was just using like, like I'm a pretty good grass person. So I would like just look at the piece of paper and be like sketching yeah. it. Um, and it'd be close. It might not be exact, but, um, but over time, you know, the little bits of non-exact with the raw dye showing. Right. Um, one of those things that nobody else would notice, but it drives yeah. you crazy. <laughs> you think that, I think that too. And then like some random collector or gallerist notices, you know, and like that's oh. the person you really don't want to notice. So like, I don't know. It's like, there's a few, there's a few of us type A's out there. that. You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
And then, well, speaking of, of uh, gallery owners and things like that, so how do you uh, how do you get your work out there? How do you promote it? How do you get your stuff displayed in galleries? What, what What's your process for promoting yourself? Like a little bit. Um, I feel like when you're when you're really like pursuing it, um, pursuing a career in art, it kind of organically unfolds a little bit. Okay. I do. There's a lot of effort put put into like showing up for things and showing up for your community. So like, um, for instance, going to grad school that I, I graduated with like 10 other people in my year that I, um, you know, they all had other careers and they'd have an opening and you go to it and you support them and they come to your opening and then you meet one of their friends and so on. Um, so like through, through other artists, I guess, um, through other artists, I've met other, I've met galleries, um, and galleries have met me through other artists. Um, I also think like through, um, what else? Applying to things. I've definitely applied to things throughout the years. Like residencies have been a big one for me. Um, I think I've done like eight residencies now. Um, I love doing them. I try and do like at least one a year um, hmm. if I can swing it time-wise. Um, but it's, it's a really good way for me to, it kind of feels like a mini grad school, you know, it's like a really good way for me to focus on my work and have time okay. away from, from um, How do you like, find the residencies? Uh, uh, I, I apply a lot online to things um, or like other artists recommend them to me, but there's some really good sites. Like um, I can send them to you. I'm trying to think like for New York, there's NYFA, New York Foundation for the Arts. Okay. And then there's also, um, I think it's, I'm not sure what the, what the page is for the residencies, but it's under the Creative Capital website. Um, some people use Res Artiste as well or cafe. Um, so sites like that, but those, those can like lead to shows because you have like a, you know, maybe you meet someone at the residency and then they right. are a curator and they want you in a show. Um, yeah, I guess throughout the years I've just built connections and Instagram too. um, build connections. And then, uh, I try and be an active member of my artist community. So I show up for a lot of, um, like either friend shows or like, uh, shows that I like that I see on Instagram or that I'm emailed about from a gallery. Like I try and like, not in a pushy way, but in a way that like, Hey, I like this art. And if someone happens to like meet or introduce me, I like genuinely tell them I like the work. Um, mm -hmm. I found that like the best way to get opportunities is to obviously put effort in to be physically present, but also to like put yourself in spaces where you like the work. Yeah. Because like if you're just trying to like get a show at this gallery that you don't really like the work, like it might not like your work either, because you know, there's taste. Um right. so if you like the work, then I'll probably gonna like your work. You know, it's like I don't know. It's I think it's But I do find it interesting because I meet a lot of people that have different backgrounds of work, but also yeah. personality wise and respect for what they do, I find that I can be drawn to people even if it's like our work doesn't work together. Our work doesn't work together. That's a weird sentence. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, uh, it, but I'll find myself really inspired by what they do, even if it's not what I do. But I'm just like, look what they've achieved with something that I am completely not interested in. You know, it's, but it's still well, yeah, I have respect as yeah. creators. I, I find that. And I'm not saying you didn't say that. I just wanted to state like I've found that out myself. Like I don't just surround myself with people who do exactly what I do is yeah. one thing I found. And that's a good thing. And also yeah. because different areas and backgrounds and uh, different types of creators have different ways and communities and ways that they do stuff. Oh, somebody's knocking. Oh, okay. I think it's just a package. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had somebody <laughs> leave a package before while doing an interview. Um, but uh, anyway, my I was just, talking about community myself and I didn't really have a point. Well, no, what you were saying though is interesting because I, I do feel like there's gal like there's different, um, there's like, like even within one gallery's roster, they'll have like a whole rainbow of like different interests. So like, yeah. so like most galleries like have paintings and have sculptures and like installation artists or maybe like a sound or light artist. And, um, but it, even still like, like, even if I, maybe I have like my bias for like the particular like work I'm more interested in, like, I'll be honest with you, I really like color. So like, maybe like black and white art sometimes a little hard for me, but I also have right. some friends that make like black and white paintings I love. 
just because like it's still in my world and so like i think if you find like an aesthetic like a gap of some galleries that like share an aesthetic with you that like um has like an umbrella over different mediums and ways of working then that's a really good home to be in um but yeah it's it's a i also think it's um there's a there's a saying that everyone says all the time which is like it's a it's a marathon not a sprint yeah and like it can be also like a little bit um dangerous or like detrimental if you do have like a huge like like spike or take off in your career really fast um it's much more like sustainable to go slow and so my my goal every year is just to like look back at the year before and feel like I like improved on my work and that I maybe made some more connections or had like one more show or like maybe not even more shows, but like maybe one of the galleries was a little bit more established than the year before. Um, just like small, small increments. Cause it's, I mean, we're artists. It's like a lifelong pursuit. We don't retire yeah. at like 60 or 70. I know. Or I know we really <laughs> don't. And even when things are, you're like, you know, even when it's like, I'm just going to stop doing this. Cause I'm not, you, yeah. we're still going to do it. We're not just going to yeah. be like, and now I'm done. I'm never going to do it again. Even if you stop putting the work out there, you're still going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> What's no, our I, problem? It's a, weird, it's a weird thing to think about, especially like with American like work culture. Um, yeah. But it's, but yeah, I think it's, it's um, just being kind to yourself and like taking it as it comes. I think it's, that's been helpful for me. I mean, yeah. I'm very ambitious. So I also like, I have to kind of like, tell myself that a lot right. <laughs> like hold on it's okay like next year <laughs> or like you know you get a, you get denied from like i get denied from so many applications and and then i people are like you get a residency every year and i'm like i know but i apply to so many right um so many i don't get um so it's it's really like yeah uh, we never brag about the ones we don't get, get. <laughs> i know i know there's there's funny because there's some artists i've seen that like make art out of their rejection letters i love it love. when people do that um, yeah, I feel like I could have a whole quilt out of my rejection. <laughs> 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 I'm only insane. Well, now most of them are digital anyways. But. Right. <laughs> so do you, uh, going through all this and getting the galleries, now a lot of this, I mean, we also want to be full-time artist. So how do you go about yeah. actually selling your work? Is it just in galleries? Do you sell online? Like what are ways that you actually yeah. profit from doing your work? Yeah. Well, I sell, I sell in a lot of different ways. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've, I've never really been true full-time artist. Like last year I had a good, maybe like six months where I was kind of close to that, okay. but you know, markets, markets come and go. And, um, yeah, I mean, that would be lovely, you know, I'll right. let you know what happens, of but, um, it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, but I, I find it's for me, it's important to just have like a flexible day job. So like sometimes I make stretchers like custom shapes and stuff for other people because i'm it's something i um could do easily in my studio um other times i'll pick up like an art handling shift um i've worked for artists in the past i've done a, a ton of different things um but for actually like how i sell work sometimes it happens through a gallery um i have a gallery i work with quite a bit in montreal oh. um and then i also work with maybe like five galleries in new york city not exclusively but um, they'll like show my work to their collectors or they'll occasionally give me like a show or a group show. Um, but it's like continued relationships. So they, um, yeah, I, I send them like PDFs of work and such. Um, and then sometimes through art advisors and all those things, like those, usually those are kind of profits that you split with them, um, with whoever's helping you. Um, but with a, sometimes I sell out of my studio as well. So I'll, maybe to like a friend um, or to other artists um, or to just a random collector who approached me through my studio. Um, like if it didn't come from the gallery, then it's like up to me until I have like a locked in representation in New York. Um, and then sometimes I do studio sales, like occasionally, like I think I'm going to do a drawing sale soon because my flat file is overflowing. I have so many drawings. Um, so yeah, occasionally I'll do stuff like that. And I try and sell those very affordably because that's kind of set aside for other artists and like um, acquaintances that maybe are newer collectors or don't have like, you know, thousands of dollars to spend on art, but want to just spend like, right. a small amount. Um, I appreciate it when artists do that. It is true. Yeah. I want to support, but I can't say spend 
like a thousand, yeah. two thousand dollars on something, yeah. even though I would like yeah. to support them. Yeah, it's it's it nice to be able to do too. that. Like, like when it's when it's low stakes, like something like a drawing, you know, like a piece of paper. Art paper is expensive, but it's not crazy expensive. And like a drawing probably only takes like a day or two, mm -hmm. versus like a painting takes a long time. You know, there's like the investment of technology, like an iPad and computer, and then paint, and then wood's expensive and labor and um die and i think it, there's so much more that goes into that so it's hard to like it feels weird if you just like kind of sell that for the cost of it you want to make some money on it right um, but for um but for like works on paper especially if a gallery is not taking half of it it's a great way to like uh, get your work out there through your community more like um yeah so sometimes i sell it that way but i try and just like have a holistic approach to everything like be realistic and um accessible for whoever is interested okay and you don't yeah. use an online card or anything like that um i i mean there's artsy which is like i don't i don't list things on artsy but my some of the galleries i work for they'll list things on artsy okay um, and then sometimes when i do art fairs like i've done quite a few art fairs now and like the, the art fair will usually have like a way of listing artworks whether it's through artsy or um a different platform um and like sometimes like i've worked with like instagram platforms that will do like an auction off of instagram yeah um, i don't have things like listed directly on my website for sale um, i have like a thing that says like email me for inquiries right yeah <laughs> and i have like a pdf usually like a pretty relevant pdf for me to go like i just like update with like um whatever new work i didn't have or something sold to make sure it's not on there um or if something's consigned to a gallery um yeah things well, like that and the reason I asked that too is also because some of your work is multiple pieces that go yeah. together in a certain way. Yes. Now, when you sell one of those, do you give them like, you know, instructions on how to put it together? Do you physically go and put it together to no. make sure it's right? Like how, how does that I, work? I think this is a question I'm still going to be like resolving the way I, the way that I, uh, I guess I have a lot of faith in people, okay. but um, I do think that, as I get older, I'm probably going to have like some kind of like equivalent of a, like a cease and desist, but for like how my artwork's supposed to go together. <laughs> um, so I don't feel like I'm like at that risk yet, but okay. I think that's also going to be something I probably work on with like a lawyer and, and like a gallery that represents me. All right. So I, I see that, I see that coming, but right now I'm like, I kind of know most of the people or I know that the, the gallery I sh like showed through like or sold through, like they know the person. So it's, I'm pretty trusting of it, but the the works they're not installations they're paintings so they are individual pieces and they like are advertised that way they're photographed that way they're physically locked together on the back and they're oh, all okay. labeled like i i am very careful to label them like one of like six or two of six so that if they ever did show up at an auction some time in 20 years like you know that it's on the back that it's one of whatever um and i only sign one piece so like they, there wouldn't be a signature on the other pieces. Um, I think about that after having worked in like some higher profile galleries, like the way that I see finished artwork being authenticated, um, I'm careful about that, but hmm. I don't have like a legal protection set up yet, but I, I will at some point. It's just, um, that takes like time and money and I, I'm not quite there. I don't think it's necessary yet, but I, some people ask like, oh, can I like rearrange the piece if I want to? And I'm like, no. Um, okay. I was wondering no, that too. Like what if they just yeah. happen to put it upside down I mean, or something? I mean, well, some people do that. Like I've, I've definitely had like, whether it's a show, I mean, my work is abstract too. Like whether it's a show or a collector, like accidentally hangs it upside down. And I try and let them know like that I, I intended it to be hung the way that the signature like um, dictates on the back. But if they, you know, like I can't, I can't control it. I don't say like you have to, mm -hmm. like I'm not a very, controlling person in that way but um i do like to let them know what my intention is and if they're the kind of like collector or like gallery dealer that they respect my intention then like that's how the work will be shown but like you when you when you sell something like you're you're kind of like making peace with it like potentially never being seen again or like you know not not to be too grim but like a lot of artwork sits at like jfk or other airports just in holding areas because it's just getting you know it's like uh neutral areas where there's no tariffs or 
mm. taxes. And so like a rich collector like buys a very expensive painting and then it just stays there. Hmm. And then someone else buys it from them, but it doesn't leave there and it goes, you know, so like some artwork will live at an airport storage unit for its entire existence of your lifetime. So huh. I try and make my piece that like it could be in someone's home like behind their couch, you know, in this beautiful, or above their couch, like right. above their bed in this beautiful way. It could be in a storage unit, like it could be upside down, but I try and make it- Somebody could be clear. propping a door open well, with I, it. <laughs> yeah, like, who knows? Like, but I try and make it very clear, like uh, what I want. I do know that I took a legal class once on artwork sales. And I do know that legally no one is allowed to damage your artwork. Like you still own oh. the rights to it being in good condition. Um, Hmm. So you can't like buy it and burn it or something. Right. I mean, okay. I don't know. How that you makes sense. I guess it never occurred to me to think that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, but I don't know. I, I guess I just try and be honest with people. But I will say that like, I make them the way I make them for a reason. Like if I, uh, I don't, I join them in a way and I paint them in a way with a lot of care, and I hope that whoever buys them is interested in that care. Um, and I would assume they would be because they they are interested in my work um, yeah. to begin with. So, but and, it's a, it's a weird, interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, and I, I realized too, I meant to ask this earlier. So before you referred to those paintings behind you as yeah. smaller yeah. ones. So how yeah. big are the average things that you make? <laughs> um, so these are, it's okay. So it's kind of tricky because okay. like the, I mean, I'll give you the answer you're asking, but before I do it, I just want to, <laughs> I want to preface that like, if you're talking about size of my work, there's like, there's size and like in the US we can go with inches. So there's like inch by inch and we can ignore the depth part because they're, you know, pretty flat paintings. Um, or there's like square inch and like square inch with my work is often fairly small because like they're shapes. So like mm -hmm. for instance, behind me, these are valid. 26 by 26 but they're not like they're not that size when it comes to square inch because they're they're very sharp and pointed so there's these huge areas that they're missing um and so when you put them in space they feel smaller than they are um so like i have for instance i have a, a very large painting that's like eight different pieces joined together into one painting um and it's 86 by 86 inches so it's very large um, but it's very pointed and it's going to be in an art fair in Toronto in October and mm. the gallerist was in my studio talking with me and she was like like this is does not feel like 86 by 86 like I thought it was going to feel a lot bigger and I was like I thought so too but you know it's it's got a lot of your space which I think is kind of nice because like in someone's home maybe it, it fits in a more custom way than like a chunky like 86 by 86 painting yeah. um but, but yeah, so they, they range. That's probably the biggest I've ever done is 86. Um, I try and like 20, like 24 or 26 is generally the smallest. I'll go if it's, if it's a shaped piece, if it's just like a square, sometimes I do those and then I'll paint shapes on them. Those can be smaller, but uh, usually anywhere between like 24 by 24 and like 60 by 60 with an occasional really big or really small, but that's, that's the range I like to work in. Okay. Um, yeah. Like scale to the body, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah. And I mean, then we already talked about how some of them are multiple pieces <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. that, and they're all like, some of them are going this way and that way. So yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> now what are some of the uh, things that you have coming up in the future or things that you would like to tell people yeah. about that they could expect or keep an eye out for from you? Yeah. Okay, let me think about this so I don't mess anything up. Um, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a few things coming up. I'm in three group shows next month. Um, one is a pop-up show in Hell's Kitchen. Okay. I'm excited about that, which is a neighborhood in Manhattan. Um, and that's just like a pop-up, though. It seems really cool. And then I'm in a show that'll be up for a few months at The Yard in um, Williamsburg. Um, and then I'm also in a benefit, which is really cool. It's like supporting um, abortion access. Um, so I have, I'm like donating a work on paper for, it's like a painting on paper for that, which opens next month. And then I have a co-show coming up in September 
um, at Marvin Gardens in the Annex, which is a which is a gallery that's it's like basically Brooklyn, but it's just on the Queens border. Um, and yeah, I have a, potentially a solo booth at an art fair in September, but we got to get accepted first. So okay. we'll see. But I'm I'm holding the paintings for it. I'm planning on it. I'm hoping, but you never know how those things go. So. Okay. <laughs> and then if people wanted to check out your work, where would you suggest that they go see it? Um, my website's a good spot, um, which is debbiekeynoteart.com. And also my Instagram, which is just, um, my handle's just my first and last name. But it's spelled a little weird. There's So Debbie is D-E-B-B-I. There's no E on the end. Um, and then keynote, it sounds like a keynote speaker, but there's no Y. So it's K-E-N-O-T-E. I mistyped that several times. It's K-E-N-O-T-E. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's a good place. Um, I'm very friendly. You can DM me. Um, <laughs> well, I, yeah and and i want to thank you so much for talking with me today this has been great yeah, yeah this has been really nice thank you